you know, you're kind of going from this focus on, you know, Apple, especially at that time, uh, I imagine it was mostly, you know, a single machine that you're kind of analyzing and seeing how uh, the the CPU or, or other components um, in that system are working. And then Google is, you know, uh, both large scale companies, but Google is very different in that you're working with large network systems where you're kind of, you know, analyzing perhaps at a data center layer. Uh, was that kind of like a, did you find that the skills translated quite a bit um, or was Google kind of like walking into a new environment for you? Some skills translated, okay. uh, but certainly, I mean, it, it, there, it's hard to answer that question, really. And and anybody who's had the the privilege of working at Google will relate, and everybody who hasn't, it's just hard to explain. Uh, not only is the scale of the systems that you're working on so vastly different, right? Like you said, it's not looking at one or 10 or a thousand machines anymore. It's looking at tens of thousands of machines, hundreds of thousands of machines. Um, and... So there, there's that angle, but also everything is managed in-house through bespoke systems and they're not intended to be shipped to customers. Whereas like with Apple, yeah, it was all a big proprietary stack, but there was definitely a focus on you have to ship things to customers. And so you can do some hacks, but you have to make it a little pretty to make it you know acceptable to the customer. With Google, you could just as long as it worked, it, it didn't matter too much. Like you needed it to be reliable, but it didn't have to be pretty necessarily. Right. Um, but it also meant that you didn't have to abide by any industry standards. You didn't have to like you, the, the design space was wide open as long as you could justify why to do it that way. And so, you know, you put those two together and you get into odd decision matrices where you're like, we're doing it completely different than everybody else does, but that's because it saves us this amount per machine, which times the number of machines makes a huge difference. Um, we used to talk about like the, the team I was in wrote, wrote um, a lot of the software that runs on every single server in Google's data centers. So there's a, you know, system daemons that manage the hardware and do telemetry and health monitoring and um, a variety of other things. But we would, we at one point did a calculation where we figured out if anyone on our team saved one megabyte of RAM, we paid for the entire team's salary for the entire year. Oh my gosh. <laughs> now, I mean, it became difficult to actually save one megabyte of RAM because we had already done a lot of that optimization to fit in there. But that was like the stakes, right? It, mm -hmm. The scale of things changes how you think about the problem a lot. Right. I was, that's actually interesting. I uh, The episode that comes out tomorrow uh, is with Matt Godbolt, and uh, he spent some time working at Google as well. And one of the things, Google as well, and one of the things that uh, we talk about on that episode is kind of like having that uh, that scale where, you know, like saving a meg of RAM is having that, that large of a cost implication uh, provides a lot of justification for working on uh, some interesting things that, you know, just wouldn't make sense economically at other other companies. Uh, did you have any examples? I mean, maybe that is one right there, right? Of like saving saving a bit of RAM. But did you have any examples of things that you worked on or you saw folks working on where uh, they got to kind of like go down that optimization rabbit hole because of the sheer scale of the systems you were working on? Oh, absolutely. It happened all the time. Uh, you know, things that come to mind. So you know how when you type in on Google search, it auto-completes for you? Right. I had nothing to do with that feature. However, that feature was burning so much CPU time in <laughs> one cluster that was depending upon a search indexing that was running in another cluster that they kept coming to me and saying, your software is saying that there are problems on the system and taking machines out, which is causing our service to be unreliable. We can't actually launch our service publicly. Hmm. And that led down a digging through so many layers of the system and ultimately figuring out that there was a bug in the CPU scheduler in the kernel <laughs> where I was being was not being given enough CPU time to actually do the work because the system was so heavily overloaded. Like I've never seen load averages in the 500s ever again. Right, right. right. Um, so there were things like that, but also things like, uh, you know how PCI Express has some uh, a lot of pins on it, and some of those pins are not commonly used, right? There's like JTAG, and there's other things. And right. there's actually ones that are reserved for future use. Well, we justified why we should dedicate 
a pair of those to be a USB uh, pair so that we could have <laughs> USB out to our expansion cards to talk to different things. Um, uh, I worked on a system where we used uh, SRIOV. I don't know how familiar folks are, but like with PCI Express, you can do IO virtualization where you make a single PCI device look like multiple devices. Mm -hmm. So you can share them with like virtual machine or like guest virtual machines or things. Um, and we have used that feature to em emulate a uh, MRIOV, which is where you have multiple computers attached to a common PCI Express fabric, and then we use PCI Express switches. So I you know, like figured out and worked with a team where we we ended up booting eight machines off of a single network card that they all shared. You know, it's just like right. not a problem that anybody else is ever going to look at, but it was a way of looking at how would you deal with bandwidth problems and the scale of how much cabling and deployment of the system, et cetera. Um, so yeah, lots of edge cases. I mean, it just probably goes on and on and on. And some of that work ended up coming out through Open Compute Project. You know, eventually mm -hmm. Google joined and some of the design work that came out. Um, even OpenBMC is a case where, funny story on that one, we were working with Rackspace on um, uh, Barrel, I, uh, Barrel IG2 is what they called it and Google called it Zaius. Um, but it was a Power 8 system, uh, IBM Power 8. And because it was going to be public uh, through Open Compute Project and because Rackspace was going to use it, they wanted to have a, a common uh, BMC or baseband management controller that, like, you know, that you would normally find on a server because that's how Rackspace's infrastructure is designed, but Google's is not. And we were trying to figure out how we were going to support it internally. And my boss was in charge of talking with um, AMI about their software stack, you know, getting a license for Mega Rack to run on this. And I made a friendly wager with him one day that after he had been trying to work with them on getting just a price quote, I said, I bet I can actually get Linux to boot on the BMC faster than you can get a quote from them. <laughs> And I did it in two days, and he it took like two and a half weeks for him to get a sales quote. So right. by the time he got a quote, we actually had a fully booting Linux stack, and that's kind of how we ended up working with the OpenBMC folks. Um, you know that, and I ended up working in that space of getting a bunch of the big industry players at the time: Facebook, Google, Microsoft, IBM, uh, all to come together and actually form that as a proper uh, project under Linux Foundation to, you know. Here's how you actually build an open source management stack for these systems. Um, but that was also driven from a need for you know solving some of these problems at scale and starting to work with with other players. But you 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 see a lot of these these things. We built you know forty eight volt to point of load uh, voltage regulation. I think no one else does this. Mm -hmm. um, but you know that's going from like forty eight volts to directly to your CPU core in one stage of conversion. But the efficiency is makes a lot of sense when you're at our at the scale of Google. 